Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this conference, virtual conference on 10 years of Pope Francis's pontificate. Uh, my name is Anthony Egan of Akima College. I am the moderator for uh, today's gathering. I'd like to start off by inviting the principal of Akima, uh, Dr. Marcel Uineza, to open the conference and make a few words. <laughs> Uh, your, your graces, your excellencies, most reverend fathers and sisters, my brothers and sisters and brother Jesuits, uh, good afternoon from this side of the world in Nairobi. Sorry for this short delay, I was waiting for the ICT to unmute me. All protocols observed, uh, we would like to welcome you to this uh, conference, online conference uh, prepared by Hekima University College. And Hekima University College is uh, an institution of the Society of Jesus in Africa that is uh, run by the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar. We are deeply honored by your presence uh, online and in present and in person for some students here at Hekima University College. And we are honored to be able to have this uh, conversation as we celebrate the 10 years of the pontificate of Francis. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for your privileged attention. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to this online conference. Hekima uh, University College is known as a rigorous academic institution. And most of you uh, probably have studied here, you will uh, likely agree with, uh, agree with me. As an academic institution, we did think it is appropriate that we celebrate uh, the 10 years of, of the pontificate of Francis with substantive conversations. Uh, we certainly are a Christian institution. We have had liturgies. I was invited to celebrate mass at the cathedral today uh, uh, in honor of Pope Francis. But uh, liturgies are wonderful, uh, but you will also agree with me that they are not enough. So we have having this conversation is key as an academic institution. So I uh, would like to thank our speakers, our eminent esteemed speakers who have agreed to speak with us, to share with us their thoughts as we celebrate this uh, milestone, these 10 years of Pope Francis. Uh, just to go quickly, uh, the speakers we have, we have uh, Father Emmanuel Roberto Agbokian Mege, uh, who is the, the president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar. And he will speak uh, or address the topic of the theology of leadership of, and leadership of, of Pope Francis. He is a man who needs no more, no greater in, introduction because many of you know him. He's published a lot. He's worked a lot in ecclesiology, in ethics, and in African theology. And very recently, he published a book on the Pope, the Pope and the pandemic, less, uh, and pandemic lessons in leadership in a time of crisis. We will be honored to listen to you, uh, Father Oroberto. We also invited uh, Sister Natalie Beckett, 
an ecclesiologist and currently serving as under secretary to the general secretariat of the synod. We could not find another better person to address the topic of Pope Francis reform and his critics. Sister Natalie has worked closely with Pope Francis and listening to her, we will be enriched. We have Chris Loney, uh, uh, a man who really is well known because of his uh, writings, but all his clarity as well. And he published a book recently, Why Pope Francis Leads the Way He Leads and Everyone Leads, How to Revitalize the Catholic Church. He has a best-selling book, Heroic Leadership, which I would invite uh, many of you to buy. He will address us on uh, the Ten, uh, on the 10 unique years of Pope Francis, what makes Pope Francis distinctive? And I can assure you, uh, having gone through his paper, you will be inspired. We have one of our own, uh, uh, one of our own, Norbert Lituang. He's a, a, a Harvard University scholar and uh, originally from Cameroon. And he will be addressing the topic of, of, of the pontificate of Pope Francis encounter with the Muslim world. He's very well versed in Islamo-Christian studies. Uh, we are privileged to have Norbert on the panel. And as you know, Pope Francis is, uh, is a bishop. And so we did invite uh, another bishop to look at Pope Francis and to offer final remarks. And this is none other than uh, Bishop Rodrigo Meia, who is a, a Jesuit, a, a man of great depth, and listening to, to him, we will be inspired. Those are the, the five speakers that we have. Uh, my role is to offer these words of welcome and opening uh, remarks. But as we really begin this conversation, let me draw your attention to a few things, maybe two or three. As we celebrate the 10 years of, of Francis Papacy, there are many reasons to give thanks. For all we can say about Pope Francis, he has refused, he has refused to be put into categories, to be confined. He is an elusive character beyond any categorization. He refused any attempt to be confined and controlled. And if there is among many qualities of Pope Francis and as a Jesuit, Francis, is a free man, is a interiorly free. For him, the gospel is the measure. And recently, in one of his speeches, he had this to say, and I quote, when there are divisions in the church, some say, may say I'm conservative, or others will say I'm a progressist, or others will say I'm a centrist. But I should reply to them and say, where is the Holy Spirit in these labels? Attention. He continues, the gospel is not an idea. The gospel is not an ideology. The gospel is an announcement that of the good news that touches the hearts and changes us. The gospel doesn't take camps, doesn't side with people, with ideological camps. If you reduce it to an ideology of the right or the left or the center, you are making the gospel into a political party like an ideology or a club. The gospel gives that freedom of the spirit, which acts and helps us to go further still. It is necessary today to take the gospel and to implore the spirit to help us advance in the right way. A man of the spirit and a man of God, and I cannot say that even more as we look at now this journey of the synod on synodality. Francis emphasis on the poor, and mercy and forgiveness and inclusiveness elevates his papacy to a level that is admired by all. At the heart of his ministry, Francis has worked hard to change attitudes towards authority in the church. Authority must be exercised as a service and with simplicity. He has denounced clericalism as a spiritual impoverishment. He has encouraged the baptized to speak out and called out for a synodal church. He has asked us to actively listen to one another, a man of listening. 
there are many qualities we can mention, but as I conclude, let me, let me, let me mention one touching moment of Pope Francis. At the heart of his pontificate, Francis had to deal with the painful reality of clergy sex abuse. Up, after his poor judgment on the abuse committed by priests and their mishandling by bishops of the bishops of Chile and other parts of the world, Pope Francis invited one of the victims of clergy sex abuse to the Vatican. His name is Juan Carlos. And as I sat together in Santa Marta, Francis said this to him, and I quote, I want to ask you for forgiveness for what you suffered. And I want to ask forgiveness for what I said, which was totally wrong when I said it in the plane and when I was in Chile. End of quote. Juan Carlos narrates that Francis was a sincere man and he saw really pain in his eyes. Francis called for a profound con con conversion for the whole church. He has visited several countries of Africa. I will not name them here. We'll come back to probably in the, during our conversation. Let me invite you all of you, as we celebrate these 10 years, to be a church that listens, a church that is free, even from structures, a church that where we realize we don't have to belong to ideological camps. The, measure road, the measuring road is the gospel. I invite you all to this, uh, to this conference. I thank our panelists and I thank Anthony Egan and the whole college of Hekima University College that has tuned in and all those who have joined Radio Maria Kenya that is broadcasting for the whole country and also Patches TV Rwanda that is broadcasting this and other avenues, Vatican Radio and the Vatican News that have published, publicized the event. I wish you all a wonderful conference and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weneza. My, my task as moderator is primarily to introduce our speakers briefly. Uh, Dr. Weneza has already done a fair amount of that already. We're going to follow the following procedure. We'll have two speakers, each speaking for 20 minutes. Then we will have 20 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, and I would ask you um, uh, to keep yourself muted during this period of the talks. Uh, and when we get to the questions, use the little button to raise your hand uh, that's on, on the Zoom. And I will, I will take your questions and, and, and forward them and, and you know you can you can address them to whichever speaker you want to do so. After that, you'll have a second hour of the same procedure. Two speakers, both of whom I'll introduce. Then we'll have twenty minutes of questions and answers. Then we'll have Bishop Rodrigo Mejia to sort of give a kind of wrap up and a perspective uh, on Francis's point, his perspective uh, on this conference, but also on the pontificate of Francis as he sees it. And we'll then have a final sort of uh, closing wrap up uh, where, I mean, Dr. Winesa and I will present sort of a final sort of reflection on the, on the day and a closing prayer. So without any further ado, I'd like to you know, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Agbon Kiamege Orobito, uh, president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa in Madagascar, distinguished theologian, writer, his most recent book, Pope and the Pandemic, Lessons in Leadership in a Time of Crisis, came out about a year ago, and who is going to speak today to us for 20 minutes on the theology and leadership of Francis. Over to you, Dr. Robert Hall. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anthony. I am going to share my screen with you. Yes, it's um, a little daunting, I should say, because as I started to look at the screen, I noticed that uh, three of my teachers were on the screen, which uh, can sometimes cause uh, anxiety. Um, so I'd like to give a shout out to Abuna Rodrigo Mejia, who taught me fundamental theology, 
shout out to Bill O'Neill, many, many encounters in Berkeley and in Hakima as a teacher, and of course, Chris Lowney on the subject of leadership. I may say that 20 minutes really is not enough to begin to talk about leadership, whether from a theological perspective or from the perspective of spirituality, um, with the example of Pope Francis, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, I don't pretend that I will be exhaustive, so I will try to just distill key elements. Of course, the title talks about theology and leadership, but I want to tie it together by focusing on spirituality. Because if we go with a theological axis, the presumption is that there is a model that Pope Francis is trying to execute or follow or within which we can fit his approach. So I want to stay on the axis of spirituality because he himself recognizes that he really doesn't have a theological model here, but he's actually responding to an invitation, a call by the risen Christ. I was just reading this morning, uh, one of the several interviews which he gave for this anniversary. And this is what he wrote or said rather, the church is not a business or an NGO. The Pope is not an administrator who has been commissioned to balance the numbers at the end of the year. Being the Pope is not an easy job. Nobody has studied before doing this. I think that is quite striking in terms of what we are trying to, to do. So I want to stay on the axis of spirituality in looking at the leadership of Pope Francis, convinced that spirituality is an anchor for theological reflection. Let's look at this screen that I have before you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quote from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, where in one of his meditations, he invites the retreatants to place before his or her mind a human leader chosen by God, whom all Christians, Christian leaders, and all Christian persons reverence and obey. And he just opposes this image of a Christian leader chosen by God with another image of the enemy, as he calls it, of the human nature. In my own meditation on Pope Francis's ministry, this text has been called. This text has been called because I believe Pope Francis fits this image of a human leader chosen by God for more Christian leaders and all Christian persons reverence. And obey. Of course, we can say not all Christian persons are celebrating today. The reality is that all those gathered on this forum recognize him as a human leader chosen by God. So when we look then at the example of Pope Francis, what comes across as core significant elements of his leadership. And for yourselves, even as you listen to this presentation, what images or model of a good leader do you have? What qualities do you look for in a leader? What does spiritual leadership look like for you? And what does Pope Francis's leadership teach us? So here are three dimensions of this leadership that I will be focusing on. His leadership is pastoral, it's prophetic, and it's spiritual. Now, when I say pastoral, I know there is another school of thought that would like to just oppose that with theological and say that Pope Francis's approach being pastoral lacks 
theological depth and foundation. I think the late John O'Malley settled that question a few years ago in one of his articles on the pastoral dimension of Pope Francis's leadership, where he demonstrates very clearly that there is nothing pastoral if it's not grounded in sound theological understanding. And it's a false dichotomy. So I believe the first element to consider is the pastoral approach of Pope Francis to leadership. And this implies that, and I will come back to this at the end, that his leadership is about people. As he just said in the quote that I read, it's not about an organization. It's not about the preservation of an organization. It's about people. The second element is prophetic. Prophetic because he uses his platform, or if you like, his podium, or his pulpit, to speak truth to reality, to speak truth to institutions, and to speak truth to personalities. Some of you are perhaps conversant with the recent spat between Pope Francis and Maduro, the president of Venezuela, where Pope Francis intervenes and really demonstrates from his prophetic stance why this political regime is inimical to the good of the people, to the common good. That's a live example of his prophetic leadership. And I finished then by adding spiritual. Pope Francis is very clear, as I read from the text of his interview, he's not a CEO. He feels called. And in fact, in that interview, he goes on to say that he hopes that the Lord would judge him on how much he has succeeded in practicing the spiritual and corporal works of mercy feeding the poor, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, visiting the imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera. That's his yardstick for measuring how well he does. And it's a spiritual yardstick. So what are these elements of his leadership? First, it's a ministry of consolation. It's a ministry of consolation. Even to this day, Francis's very familiar refrain is, I am close to people. I am close. I am close to the pain. And I am close to the suffering. And therefore, his approach is to comfort they are afflicted. And that doesn't remove the fact that it can also afflict the comforted, as I just said, talking about the prophetic stance that it takes. But rather, what is key here is that his idea of leadership and his practice of leadership is grounded on the practice of console, consoling and accompanying people. Is grounded in solidarity, compassion, mercy, and hope. And his idea of solidarity, as we have seen in Fratelli Tutti, is one in which we actually place ourselves in the path of the downtrodden, of the marginalized, of the exploited. Ministry of consolation. Second element. It is that it is a practice of preference of love. We're used to that expression, preferential option, which in a way has become banalized. But from the perspective of Pope Francis's practice, it's very clear where his preference lies. It's with those who we tend to live behind 
And even this morning in the interview, he was already talking about a globalization of indifference, a world that has become satiated and sated with its own affluence reserved to a few that tends to leave behind others. And so in practicing the preference of love, the important thing is to begin at the margins, at the periphery, where we have banished the vulnerable, the weak, where we have banished those who count for nothing in society. And that's where Pope Francis exercises his leadership as a pastor, as a prophet, and as a spiritually grounded person. The third element, which I would like to underline, is that yes, it is okay to see where humanity is broken, but what I find fascinating, reading Pope Francis's ex example of leadership, is that he's good at celebrating the inherent goodness of human beings. And so when people step up to make a difference, part of his idea as a leader or his practice as a leader is to recognize that, to celebrate the best manifestations of the human spirit. And if you look at the time of COVID, the years, the high peak years of COVID, when he spoke about people who were given of themselves to make a difference in the lives of others, he had these wonderful expressions, soldiers of love, bedside angels, martyrs of charity, guardians of hope, custodians of the flame of mercy, saints next to that. This is an expression of his celebration of the inherent goodness of human beings, basically reminding us that deep within us lies the possibility to make a difference, to do good. I'm gonna come back to this question of spirituality. As I've said already, when it comes to leadership, Pope Francis is not, does not see himself as a CEO. He sees himself as a pastor, and before that, a disciple, one who is called to follow. And so everything springs from that interior space of prayer and silence. And for me, there is no better demonstration of the rootedness of the leadership of Pope Francis in a spiritual soil than his message to the world on the 27th of March, 2020, at the peak of the COVID pandemic. And there you see him alone in prayer, but connected with the world. And so profound is his life and spirit. It embraces the world. Think about it, what that does for leadership. If we are able really to be rooted in prayer and silence, Think about it. The next point I want to underline, talking about his example of leadership as a spiritual expression, is building bridges. And, and when you look at the readings and, and, and the expressions and, and everything he said, this theme is very important of building bridges. In his recent book, Let Us Dream, after the pandemic or during the pandemic, he comes back to this theme of building bridges. Of course, as Pope, his pontifex, Maximus, the greatest bridge builder, but he wears this not only as a title, but actually as a way of life, of exercising his pastoral leadership. Bridges to where? Well, not bridges to nowhere, Bridges across religious divide, as we see him do in reaching out to practitioners 
of the Islamic faith. Bridges to all categories of people, as we see him do in his commitment to migrants and refugees, to elderly people, to children, to youth, to prisoners. And as we have seen him demonstrate over and over to the chagrin of some people, bridges across to sexual minorities in the Christian community. And again, this is critical because not only is he building a bridge, he himself is that bridge. He himself is that bridge. And we saw that demonstrated recently in DR Congo and in South Sudan, where he makes it possible for people to walk across divide and to recognize in one another a fraternal link. His example of leadership entails the courage to change, to be converted, be transformed. You know, the example that uh, Father Marcel Winesa pointed out at the, in his introduction is quite typical of Pope Francis. Saying sorry is not a mark of weakness. In fact, it is a sign of authenticity. It is a powerful tool for preaching and proclaiming the good news. And we saw Pope Francis live through change and conversion and transformation over these 10 years. In all the crises he has handled, he has come out a changed, converted, and transformed leader. And that's critical because what he teaches us is that the leader is not the one who knows it all. It's not the infallible one. Rather, the leader is the one who is willing to learn, to change, to convert, and to be transformed. So let me conclude with three points um, as my time comes to an end. The first, when you go back to the three elements that I pointed out, astral, prophetic, and spiritual, it all comes down to one thing, that it's about people, their well-being, their dignity, their humanity. I quote this text from Pope Francis from the New York Times, where he says, in this past year of change, my mind and heart have overflowed with people. I think of and I pray for and I sometimes cry with people with names and faces, people who died without saying goodbye to those they love, families in difficulty, even going hungry. Because there is no work well-being, dignity, and humanity of people. The second point I want to make is this, that courageous, competent, committed, conscientious, and compassionate leadership is a matter of life and death. And Pope Francis shows that when leaders live up to their solemn responsibilities and commitments, they can be the difference between light and darkness, hope and despair, life and death of the people whom they have the privilege of serving and protecting. And the final point I want to make, and I think this is a good segue to the next presenter, is precisely this. As a human leader chosen by God, for Francis's approach is a reminder that we're all leaders and we're leading all the time. And here I quote Chris Lowney from his book, Heroic Leadership. With this, I would like to end my presentation on Pope Francis's leadership and why I believe as an expression of his spiritual life remains for us a lesson for the ages. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Father Roberto. And um, we're going to proceed now to our next speaker, Sister Natalie Becker, uh, who is the Under Secretary to the General Secretariat of the Synod on Synodality. Uh, Xavier's sister 
She studied theology at Centre Serve in Paris and did her graduate studies in ecclesiology at Boston College. Um, Sister Natalie will speak to us on Pope Francis, reform and his critics. Over to you, Sister Natalie. Sister Natalie, are you with us? I'm afraid we seem to have lost Sister Natalie. Um, are you there, Sister Natalie? Looks like we've not been able to reach Sister Natalie. Are you available, Sister? Can you send me a message on the on the chat if you are on? Don't see anything. Sister Natalie might not be available at the moment. So what I'm going to do is ask Chris Lowney to, to present the next presentation. Um, Chris Lowney is a former Jesuit scholastic who subsequently served as managing director of JP Morgan and Company on three continents and has written a number of books on leadership and Ignatian spirituality and has written extensively on Pope Francis. So I would invite um, Chris Lowney to join us. He's going to speak on 10 unique years. What makes Pope Francis distinctive? Um, over to you, Chris Lowney. Uh, thank you, Father Anthony. Um, give me a thumbs up. The uh, volume is okay. You can hear me? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you, Father Marcel and team, for the kind introduction. And I'm sorry, Sister Natalie is not here for many reasons, including that now I must follow Father Bator, which is a deeply intimidating uh, thing for me to do. Um, and I don't know if the ICT team is able to share a PowerPoint from me. Uh, if not, I would invite them to put it up. I will use it only for a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, I see it coming. Uh, I'll use it only for a couple of minutes in the introduction, then they will take down the ICT and I will speak without it. Uh, so um, I hope you will now see a cover slide from me, which has all my contact information. Uh, I'll be using uh, many quotes. Um, I will not be putting them in PowerPoint, unlike Father Bator, but you're very welcome to have my uh, full talk. Just send me an email, and I'm very happy to contact on various social media. And in terms of an agenda, uh, visually, that's on the next PowerPoint slide, if we put that up. <clears throat> and uh, basically, I'm going to be talking about uh, four ideas, and uh, they're in some way or another visually depicted on this slide here. And maybe looking at these pictures, you cannot uh, tell in words what I will be saying. So let's go to the next PowerPoint. And these will be uh, my agenda that you could follow along. First, the peripheries are not peripheral. Becoming a whole church, that will be the first idea. Uh, the second idea, dusty shoes, becoming a deeply pastoral church. I'll echo something that Father Bator spoke about. Third idea, navigating stormy, sees becoming a discerning church. 
And then finally, I will talk about something that's not distinctive about Francis. Empty pews rising to our challenges. So that's my, um, that's my agenda. I'll ask the ICT folks to take the PowerPoint down at this point, and I will just speak without slides. And um, in going through these four ideas, I hope that they will hang together, not like a list, rather like a coherent narrative. And indeed, I hope that those in this audience will hear in my narrative a personal call, a call to action, a call to leadership. Uh, now, with that, uh, let me begin with the first idea, becoming a whole church. And please pardon that I will read a lot of my talk here and need, therefore, my old man glasses. Um, the peripheries. You'll recall uh, Francis, almost his very first words as Pope from St. Peter's Loggia, right after he was elected. You know that the task of the conclave was to give Rome a bishop. It seems that my brother cardinals went almost to the ends of the earth to find one. And indeed, even before the conclave, before he was elected, Pope Francis was uh, uh, emphasizing this idea uh, during his pre-conclave talk to his fellow cardinals. He said, the church is called to come out of herself and go to the peripheries. Now, I'm not a papal historian by any means, but I'm quite sure that if recent popes have used this notion of peripheries, it's only been in passing. For Francis, on the other hand, it's a core preoccupation, so much that he's sometimes been nicknamed the Pope of the Peripheries. His en enactment of this priority shows up in many ways. One obvious one is the composition of the College of Cardinals, where Francis bypassed cities that traditionally had cardinals, like Los Angeles and Philadelphia in my country, and instead has focused on places like uh, Mongolia that had never had cardinals. But I believe what Francis is really getting at with this notion of peripheries has been in one important way misunderstood and in one important way not taken to heart by our church. How it's misunderstood. It's natural to think of those at the peripheries as, well, peripheral, extra, non-essential. And I fear a damaging, almost subconscious assimilation interpretation of this call to the peripheries that it's somehow a call to those of us who have long been at the center of the church's administration, typically white men of the global north, uh, that we're being called, invited to reach out to the rest of folks who are somehow less important subconsciously because they're at the peripheries. In fact, it seems to me that essentially what Francis is really saying to us is quite the opposite. As if he's saying, hey, friends, look at the reality of our church. The majority of the people of God are somehow living at so-called peripheries. Women, for example, comprise more than half of the Catholics who attend mass. Africa, Latin America, and Asia account for two thirds of Catholics. More pointedly, the only place where the church is really growing is among communities that have historically been the so-called peripheries. Think of one fact among many, across the coming three decades, it's estimated that the Catholic 
population in Europe will likely decline by about 15 million people. Africa's population, Catholic population in contrast, will grow by about 115 million people. Now, if one of these uh, symbolic senses of going to the peripheries is reaching out to smaller Catholic communities like Mongolia, another more important, more essential sense of what this idea of peripheries really means is, if I could put it this way, deperipherizing those whom we have peripherized so that we can become once again, or for the first time, a whole church. A church that better integrates, integrate, recall that the word, the roots of this word means to become whole. The majority of our people uh, with respect to decision-making, discussion, cultural exchange, strategy session, feeding our growth in all kinds of ways. If I feel this notion of the peripheries has been a bit misunderstood, I also fear that it's not quite been taken completely to heart, which gets to my second theme about Francis' distinctiveness, dusty shoes. That is becoming a more pastoral church. Let me quote more fully uh, Francis' pre-conclave talk, which I referenced earlier. Uh, he said uh, that the church must go out of herself and go to the peripheries, not only geographically, but to the existential peripheries, the mystery of sin, of pain, injustice, ignorance, and indifference to religion, of intellectual currents, and all misery. This is essentially a call to a more radical outreach, a more radical kind of pastoral accompaniment than we've heretofore practiced as a church. And this pastoral emphasis is not something he only discovered when he became Pope. It's been core to his whole priestly life. When I researched uh, the book, Pope Francis, why he leads the way he leads, I was deeply touched by an anecdote told me by a Jesuit priest who was then a scholastic, uh, who volunteered to help Bergoglio uh, to launch a new parish in an impoverished shanty town around Buenos Aires. Francis' instruction, Bergoglio's instruction, to those seminarian volunteers was simple. Walk the barrio in which our new parish will be located. Meet the people, spend time with them, listen. How would Bergoglio understand who was doing their job well? He stood at the entrance to their seminary residence late in the afternoon and looked down at the feet of the seminarians as they returned from this work. Who had dusty shoes? Those are the ones who are doing what the church needs. And such pastoral care has remained his priority today. I can assure you, as many of you know, uh, Francis has adopted a beautiful custom of whenever he visits a, a, a new country, sitting down with the local Jesuits who happen to meet there. And one Jesuit told me that uh, on his recent visit to South Sudan, when one of those in this little meeting asked for the Pope's advice for their ministry and work, he gave a concise three-part answer. He said this, quote, stay very close to the people. Ours is a ministry of presence among the people. Two, be very compassionate, forgiving. Three, have courage, do not quit. Now, if I asked you to think of the quotes or images from Francis that you find most memorable or characteristic, I bet most of the ideas that would come to your mind would reinforce 
this idea of a new kind of pastorality. For example, somebody may say, oh yeah, I remember the church is a field hospital after battle. Someone else may say, oh yeah, we need shepherds who have the smell of the sheep. I'm convinced that we have no hope of thriving as a church in the 2020s will not answer our calling unless we're willing, if I can put these images together, unless we're willing to get our shoes dusty and take on the smell of the sheep by entering life's figurative battlefields and accompanying God's people in this new way. But what I just said raises important questions, which gets to my third idea. Uh, what would thriving as a church look like? What are we called to? Uh, this gets to my third idea, navigating stormy seas. We must become a more discerning church. Indeed, the moment is long overdue for such discernment because we're suffering an upper room moment. Remember when those uh, disciples were gathered in the upper room, confused and unsure. If we're honest, we too should be confused and unsure. Our credibility has been damaged by our own sexual and financial scandals. Society is secularizing rapidly around us. Our ability to engage young adults, especially in the global north, has diminished badly. Francis, not long after his uh, becoming Pope, used ocean seafaring imagery to describe our storm-tossed church out on these confusing open waters, but listen to his optimistic, proactive conclusion, quote, assume always the spirit of the great explorers, that we're not frightened by borders and of storms, may it be a free church and open to the challenge of the presence, present, never in defense for fear of losing something. The synod on synodality, uh, we could consider Francis' initiative for charting our navigational course. And if anything is distinctive, surely this synod is. To use a very imperfect secular analogy, it's like the strategic pathfinding that every major corporation must now undertake in this confusing era. Except, astoundingly, whereas corporate course setting might involve a few dozen executives, Francis had the ambitious, incredible vision of inviting a billion Catholics around this strategy setting table. And of course, my secular analogy to corporate strategy setting is fundamentally flawed because corporate strategy setting involves only humans. And Francis has invited the Holy Spirit to this table. It's a discernment exercise. Now, this grand experiment in communal discernment has been wonderfully invigorating, not to mention breathtaking in its sheer scale. But that's not to say everything has gone perfectly or even well. There, has, there was no handbook for how a global church could conduct a communal discernment. Think of it, many of you are Jesuits, uh, you needed months and even years to understand the rudiments of Ignatian discernment. Uh, think of among the many things that could be confusing or difficult for the billion of us lay Catholics to become discerning people so quickly. Uh, for example, when Francis talks about freedom, in the Ignatian sense of becoming free from internal attachments that would hinder us from following God's call, some of Francis' critics instead hear the word freedom 
and think of it as a reckless freedom to change doctrines and institutions we don't like. And so, understandably, many participants entered this synod in the form of a J.P. Morgan corporate strategy debate rather than a spirit-led discernment. Now, I talk about the difficulties we've had fully realizing this beautiful idea, not to undermine the idea of the synod, but instead to introduce my fourth final theme, what has not been distinctive about the church during the Francis years. I call the fourth idea rising, uh, sorry, empty cues, rising together to meet our challenges. In Bergoglio's pre-conclave talk, he spoke about, quote, the sweet, comforting joy of evangelizing. His landmark first encyclical, Evangelii Gaudium, was all about the joy of uh, evangelizing. Well, that call was not distinctive. Pope Paul VI first started ringing the alarm bell for the church when he practically begged us to, quote, revise methods, to seek by every means of study how we can bring the Christian message to modern man. He questioned whether we were well equipped to do so. That urgent call has been echoed by every Pope since. John Paul II, for example, as the new millennium dawn said, quote, the moment has come to commit all the church's energies to a new evangelization. No institution can avoid this supreme duty. All the church's energies, a supreme duty? Let me be as blunt as I can be. Nothing remotely like this has happened. How could we as a church have been so complacent, so sluggish now for five decades as the, chance, as the challenges I mentioned earlier have snowballed? Well, I interpret all three of the distinctive ideas that I've raised so far as Francis' effort to shake us from our torpor to inspire us to find new ways to accompany modern men and women more energetically in new ways. Um, now, I point out the persistence of our challenges not to be a downer in what the team here has appropriately imagined as a celebration. Rather, I, I bring up these challenges uh, here in this audience that includes many in the global south as a kind of call to action because I think your leadership moment is now here and is now essential. Because frankly, it's hard for me individually to resist the temptation to think that the church in the global north has lost its mojo Mojo is not a word you will, you will find in your dictionary of systematic theology. You will find it on the streets of New York City where I grew up. If I could translate it, think of it as the kind of enterprising, indefatigable, imaginative, creative spirit that drove Paul across the ancient Near East. It's not that we in the global north are out of ideas. Exactly the opposite. We have plenty of ideas, including many great ideas. But the ideas sometimes seem to be all we have. And so we debate them like a debating society. And ideas alone will never help us meet our challenges. What will? Well, even though Pope Benedict XVI was unfairly criticized for being a sterile 
man of ideas. He knew what our church's fate depended on. As he put it, quote, we have come to believe in God's love. Being Christian is not the result of a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. I promise our organizers, I just have one more minute. I see my time has come. I saw this living, loving encounter not many months ago when my wife and I attended mass in Zimbabwe one Sunday. When I returned to the US, I told more than one friend, I wish that every discouraged American Catholic could have been dis uh, transported to experience that mass. I felt palpably that the mojo was there, the spirit that drove St. Paul, or in Benedict's language, this was a community enlivened by encounter. And I've often found this all throughout the continent in many places I've visited. And so my humble concluding opinion, we will only meet our challenges as a church by rediscovering our mojo. And we will do so by fully embracing the three very distinctive dimensions of the Francis papacy. That is one, by drawing to the center our vibrant, growing, and up to now peripheral communities like so many in the global south. And second, by undertaking a more zealous, intimate, newly styled pastoral accompaniment of all those who suffer. And third, by praying hard together to call God's Holy Spirit to help us discern where we are being called in these 2020s and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris Downey. Very exciting talk. We're now going to head for some questions for about 15 minutes. Uh, what I propose then is that people just, you know, use that little button to sort of have the hand up and I will try and take them down in order and I will just call out the next person in line so that you've got to keep your hand up. So would someone like to open with a question? Please state your name, where you're from, and who you asking the question to specifically, but also uh, please be brief. Do we have any questions so that I can unmute you if you have a question? Seem to have, maybe questions coming up on the chat. No, it's just applause for our speakers. Um, well, all right, I think I'm gonna kick off and ask a question. Um, uh uh, there is there are two hands up. There is an Hundo Paddington and there is the Dean Hipster. Okay, they have their hands yes. up. We, I, I'm trying to identify. Yes. Um, would please please continue. First question. Yep. Okay, Dean, may I? <laughs> All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our speakers and uh, for their valuable contribution. Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, and I direct it straight to both of them, uh, to Father Battle and then uh, to uh, Chris. What would uh, a prophetic mode of leadership look like in the corporate world? 
care to respond? <laughs> Thanks. Could you lower your, your hand? Um, I think that's a question straight, straight to Chris. <laughs> well, I, I don't mind, uh, I don't mind speaking first, but I think we would all have uh, opinions ab about that. Um, so first, uh, you, you didn't ask what would it look like among those of us who run uh, spiritual and religious institutions, schools, retreat centers, seminaries, and so on. So I'll take the liberty of making one comment about that and then about corporate life. Um, you know, to me, at the end of the day, the a, a core dimension of leadership is, can you point the way for us and influence others toward it? And so at least I, as I would see it, drawing on my understanding of Francis, leadership for us in the church would be, uh, gee, can I be the one who in some small way or large way helps to inspire the people around me to, to understand, okay, look, we need to somehow find ways of reaching out to young people, to those who've turned away from us, to those who don't believe at all, and uh, sharing good news with them in a way that's meaningful to them and might in, involve them in encounter with us. So this is one idea. Now, you said, uh, what about in corporate life? And, uh, you know, I am a... Um, Catholic in the workplace, and I guess many of us are religious people, Muslim, Jewish, uh, spiritual people in the workplace. And, you know, every country is different. In the U.S. context, uh, those who are religious have the challenge that to be very explicit about our religious beliefs is not considered often appropriate. And many then lapse into the exact opposite, meaning I put my beliefs completely aside and when I'm in the workplace, I'm free to adopt whatever Darwinian values I see around me. And that is absolutely deadly. So in, I would say leadership in a corporate environment would involve that we take those values that might have deep religious roots for us. What does it mean to be just, to be charitable? and so on, and that we find uh, ways to express and express those and influence others in workplaces so that they will take up and champion what does it look like to be a just manager? What does it look like to be an organization that, for example, cares about the environment, not just about our profits, and so on? Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Dr. Marcel Ruinez has got a question for the, the panel. Can, uh, Marcel, would you respond with the question? Sure, sure. I, would, I would like to ask a question rather uh, to Ada, Father Orobato, or Mr. Loni. Uh, you've spoken about the leadership of, of Pope Francis. And my question is, if you were a Pope, uh, what would you do differently, um, given the style that you have seen? Uh, and I'm not anticipating that you are becoming a pope, but I'm trying to imagine uh, what will be your distinctive mark, which uh, which road would you would you not take that Pope Francis has taken? I I will yield to Father Batra to go first, because uh, at least I think he has a chance. I mean that's 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 a wild imagination, extremely wild, so wild it's certainly unrealizable, certainly not in my lifetime. Um, so what would I do differently? I guess I would uh, choose the name Kizito Balikudembe, uh, the first, and um, to give precisely voice to the very powerful uh, elaboration that um, Chris uh, made when he talked about the periphery not being peripheral, uh, basically to reposition this global community at its very center, 
which is precisely those areas where we have neglected. I think for me, that will be very critical. Um, I think it's also be going to be very critical that we are able to bridge those ideological divides. Um, you made a point about Pope being called a centrist, uh, leftist, uh, rightist. Um, this is not in the gospel as okay. we know it. I think calling us back to who we are as uh, people who are animated and inspired by the gospel is very critical. So I will leave it at that. But again, this is just, you know, um, imagining the unimaginable, Chris. We have time for two more questions. Uh, Father Elias had a question, and then we have Nundu Parinton. So Elias, would you like to raise your question? I thought Chris was responding to something before I came in, but... Oh, sorry, were you Chris? No, 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 please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, well, my, my question to um, Chris and Bato can come in as well. Um, it's just a question on will, will Pope Francis' legacy survive uh, beyond him? There have been a lot of criticisms, even uh, from the introduction of Marcel and others who've uh, said, is he journeying alone? Is he journeying alone with people? And, and synodal process has been very helpful uh, in that in kind of bringing everything together. Uh, but I'm just wondering with all the kinds of resistance that he has faced, uh, will will we survive his legacy? Does he have enough moral and leadership support around the the, the church hierarchy uh, to get this moving? And and then uh, even some of his uh, how, where do we place some of his off the cuff comments, uh, which sometimes have been a great relief, but sometimes have caused a lot of confusion. Uh, my other question was uh, to Bato, because we've just referred to it uh, briefly, uh, uh, issues of ideology, uh, peripheral and the center. Roger Haidt uh, talked about this sometime back already in early 2000s, uh, that there will come a time when the periphery will be the, the center. And I think Priest has said that the church is uh, growing much more in, uh, in the global south. So is the church ready for this? Uh, are we open to discuss issues of um, ideologies, racism, resistance uh, of the African Asian church uh, in, in, in bringing these issues to the table uh, and saying that you know, the church needs to be a little bit more uh, representative than what it looks like right now? Thank you. So maybe I will uh, speak to the first comment since you uh, addressed it to me, uh, Elias, and then I will yield to Father Bator for the second idea you mentioned. So um, will, his, will, will this uh, movement or whatever word you want to put on it, uh, will it have a lasting influence in the church? And uh, I, now I'm speaking personally, I have no doubt it will, you know, and I sometimes think about, uh, I'm American, but I'm, my parents were Irish, and one of the great uh, Irish poets is Yeats. And one of his great lines is, uh, all is changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. And there is a level at which I feel something has begun that cannot be undone. Now, having said that, having said that, let me make a, a human comment, not a church comment, because many of you, many of us, are managers or leaders in organizations. And one, um, one uh, guy who was very influential in my own understanding of good leadership used to stress for managers, and this would go for all of you, whatever, whether it's a school, a theologate, whatever is your organization, he used to stress the importance of forming what he called a guiding coalition. And he didn't mean that in the sense of hierarchy. It could be higher, you know, people who are in hierarchy, but who are the, who, can I pull together a group of either uh, hierarchical leaders, influencers, true believers, 
who will help to uh, harness, get into the harness with me to pull the organization forward in this new direction. Um, and, you know, Pope Francis needs no advice from me. I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined something so beautiful as the synod on synodality. But I do think that uh, something important for every manager, every leader is, do I, have I paid enough attention to pulling together this guiding coalition of willing uh, acolytes, soldiers, true believers who are going to help me uh, carry the yoke of driving this change forward. That would be my thought. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Bartol, would you like to respond to that? Yes, question? I would just make uh, three comments to follow up on Chris's uh, comment. Um, I am of the opinion, and it's a personal opinion, that Francis is not worried about legacy. He's not worried about legacy because when you become focused on legacy, you're actually focusing on yourself. And that's how we end up in Africa with statutes and buildings and roads and monuments named after uh, incompetent and inept uh, kleptocratic leaders. And that's not Francis. Uh, his emphasis is on the spirit who guides the church. And that's what sustains the vision that he has. If I, if I may just make a, an, an anecdote, some of you may be familiar with the political process in Nigeria with the third candidate, outside candidate who, show, who showed up and shook up the whole system. And one of the criticism that he had to weather was, you know, where is your structure? You don't have a structure. You don't have buildings and offices across the country. And he said, the people are my structure. And I use that as an analogy for Francis to say that, as Chris said, his ability to convene people around idea, around a vision is sustainable. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is that uh, about the periphery and the center analogy, um, people who write about this uh, make clear that it's not exclusive. It's not about setting one against the other. In a way, one other way of looking at it is to say is to recognize the many centers and the many in the many peripheries, so that there is complementarity. And as an African Catholic. I don't look at the global north and lament the diminishment of the Christian community, but also seeing that a vision, a mission, a call to be an instrument of regeneration, as Chris mentioned when he referenced his experience in Zimbabwe. So it's, I don't see it as this mutually exclusive because we fall then back into that whole culture war of left, right, center. But rather, as Chris carefully mentioned, it's about pulling the entire community together to recognize where in fact the spirit is alive and active today as a community as a community. And finally, I would say, there's one thing I've learned from Pope Francis when it comes to leadership, is that leadership is a grace. It's an opportunity to do good. And you have it once, and you don't care about what comes after. The important thing is not to miss that opportunity to do good. And that's exactly what he's doing. Whether he lives another 10 years, another 20 years, I don't know. But the important thing is that there is good that we recognize, I recognize, for the church and for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Bartol. Uh, I've got two small questions that I've got on the, on the meeting chat. The one is from Tadios Wasige. Uh, briefly, Chris Lani, do you think Pope Francis has prepared the church for discernment? And from Nundu Partington, who works with the International Movement of Catholic Students Africa, uh, also to Chris Loney, 
from what has happened in other countries and your experience in Zimbabwe during mass, what should the Global South not do in terms of accompanying young people in the church? Uh, Chris, would you like to just briefly give us a few thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll speak to the first, if, if it's okay, I think I would prefer to lateral the second question about what should the church not do, uh, maybe lateral that to uh, Father Bator, just because, you know, what, what, how, can I, how can I speak with any credibility about, about that? Um, anyway, to the first question, is, is the uh, church, have, have we been well prepared for this discernment exercise we're all in together? And, you know, again, I'm not speaking in this case as uh, an informed pundit. I'm speaking as an individual who lives in New York, who watches and participates in the process. And I guess I feel that um, at one level, absolutely. Many people have, have entered it exactly as they were called to enter it and they're sharing exactly as they were called to share. So yes. At another level, to be honest, I feel like what I see around me to an extent sometimes um, drifts toward what might have happened at JP Morgan, my old employer. In other words, where human beings sat around a table, each with human opinions about what we should do and debated those with each other. And that is not really what Francis has called us to, of course. Uh, instead, we're to sit there and call God's Holy Spirit into our midst. And that's been articulated clearly enough. But I think there's process and practice in uh, learning to do that well that has not altogether uh, been rooted in every place. But my last thing would be, so what? So what? God's Spirit finds a way of working and um, there, there's a great uh, cliche that something that's really worth doing is worth doing even not well. And far better that we undertake this process. The process itself is its own reward, its own learning, and we will get better on it. As opposed to having a three-year training on uh, the rudiments of discernment and then beginning. That wouldn't have been the right thing to do here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bartol, very quickly, would you like to I respond? I would um, respond to Pardon Bean's uh, question by just mentioning the fact that I have been privileged to have been part of the unfolding process of synodality and the various steps preparing that within the continent in Africa, as I'm sure you have been Pardon Tin. And from what I have experienced, I will say two things that we must not do. First, we must not ignore young people. And secondly, we must listen and learn from young people. That has been a constant in all the processes that I have been involved in, in this uh, synodality, uh, the journey of synodality. And I'm sure that is something you have uh, heard. And as Chris pointed out, um, and uh, demographically, you know, the church in Africa is predominantly young and also predominantly uh, uh, female. And so in that sense, I just think listening, learning, and avoiding the, the, uh, the trap of, of uh, thinking we know it all. Thank you. Thank you, Bartol. Um, folks, we're all too aware of the fact that we are running uh, behind time, but I think something that's good is worth listening to. And so without further ado, I am going to introduce our next two speakers. And the first speaker is Sister Natalie Becker, uh, Under Secretary of the General Secretariat of the Synod and a specialist in ecclesiology with background from saint Cyr in Paris, and Boston College. Sister Natalie, welcome to our conference and um, please continue. 
Yes, thank you so much uh, for your invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you uh, today. I'm truly, truly sorry, and I really apologize because I did a mistake with the time change. So I just arrived, uh, and I am very, really, very sorry for that. But I am glad uh, to be with you uh, to share very I'm in a very humble, humble way, a few thoughts on the, uh, Pope Francis uh, and, his ref uh, and his reform of the church that he's leading and also his, uh, his critics, um, especially in the lens uh, of this experience we are having today. All the church, as you know, has been convoked in a synod. Uh, so in the light of synodality, I would like to highlight a few points uh, regarding the, the reform of the church. When we speak about synodality, uh, and you know, maybe one of the key speech of Pope Francis during all his 10 years of pontificate is uh, the, uh, his uh, speech for the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishop. Uh, in which he states that uh, the world of today needs synodality. We can say in a way, synodality is the vocation of the church for uh, the third millennium. Synodality, as Pope Francis is stating in another uh, text, is the way of being the church today according to the will of God in a dynamic of discerning, and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I like very much a quote from an Australian theologian, Armon Rush. He states that synodality is the second Vatican Council in a nutshell. So what we are living now with Pope Francis, and I really think that uh, the reform is carrying on, is to advance to move forward the reception of the Second Vatican Council. We can, the program of Pope Francis, in a way, is nothing else that in continue to continue the implementation of uh, the Second Vatican Council, especially with his vision of the church as people of God, uh, the call to uh, leave the church as uh, Lumen Gentium is stating, uh, as a church of missionary pilgrim on the road, a church on the move. And to understand how Pope Francis is embracing uh, this call for um, uh, a church that is always reforming herself, Ecclesia uh, Semper Reformada, we have to understand that his vision and his experience of the church is a church on the move. Because uh, synodality is a dynamic vision of the church in history. And with the Second Vatican Council, the church has in a way retrieved the fact that the church is, the human face of the church is experienced and lived in history, in the culture, in the different uh, context. So the starting point for synodality, that is the starting point of Pope Francis and that can help us to envision the way he's leading uh, his reform is not an idealistic uh, theoretical vision, but the situationness, the concreteness, uh, the vision of an incarnated church that journey with the people. Because Pope Francis, as you know, as a Jesuit from Argentina, Bishop of Buenos Aires, has been shaped by, ex by the experience of the reception of the Second Vatican Council in Latin America, especially through um, the different conferences organized by the CELAM. As you know, he was one of the main drafters of the final document of Aparecida, calling for a pastoral conversion. So for Pope Francis, 
we can't speak about reform, reform of the church, reform of the Roman Curia. He has been elected uh, for a clear mandate to lead this reform. And we can see how uh, with the new constitution of the Roman Curia, Predicate Evangelium, he has advanced uh, this uh, reform. But the starting point for Pope Francis is a personal conversion. There is no reform of the church without uh, a personal path of conversion and a communal, uh, a communal path uh, of conversion. And these 10 years of the pontificate of Pope Francis really uh, highlight that one of the main instruments for the reform uh, of the church that Pope Francis has chosen is uh, the Synod of Bishop. As you may know, the Synod has been instituted at the end of the Second Vatican Council in 1968, uh, at the beginning of the fourth session of the Council as a decision from Pope uh, Paul VI, but uh, his decision what was a kind of answer to the call of many uh, um, council fathers who ask to continue something in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council and to have a body, a permanent body, um, to experience uh, this uh, collegiality of all the, all the bishops. And um, I, I would like uh, to uh, quote uh, at this stage, a um, famous uh, Jesuit who was an historian, uh, John O'Malley, uh, that you may know, he has worked a lot on the history of synods uh, and uh, council. And um, he has also written on the history of the reform of the church. And what he stated that is very interesting, John O'Malley, uh, in an article published uh, in a French review, states that all the history of the reform of the church told us that the most important point or turning point in the, in the reform are those who are the most debated, those uh, that encounter the strongest resistance. And we can see that, uh, especially at the Second Vatican Council, the <laughs> debate on uh, the notion of collegiality, the idea that the Pope is not alone to exercise his primacy, but is part of a college of bishops. Uh, the Second Vatican Council debating and then retrieving this notion of uh, collegiality was uh, one of the greatest and most controversial novelties of the uh, Council. Why I highlight that? Because in a way, everywhere you have uh, a process of reform, a process of change, a process of conversion, led by you try to discern how the Holy Spirit is uh, leading the, the church and to discern, you can experience as we experience that in our personal life, that uh, you have also resistance, uh, oppositions. That's why uh, we can't speak about reform of the church in a way. It's very normal that you have critics and a uh, movement uh, that try uh, to debate uh, important notion. And through this synod on synodality, what we see uh, is both, and I'm coming back, uh, I'm now in Rome after many weeks of traveling to take part 
to uh, the continental assemblies of the Synod. I was first in Oceania, then in Middle East, then Asia, then I was in Africa, where Father Orobator was there also uh, for this ecclesial assembly of, um, of Africa. And I can really say that we have contemplated uh, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, through these continental assemblies and how uh, when people gather together, listen to each other in a spirit of prayer, discernment with this methodology of uh, spiritual conversation, you experience the fruits of synodality. Um, so we can already see how this synod is bearing fruits at the grassroots, fostering communion, participation, of uh, all the people of God for the mission of the church. But we can see at the same time that uh, there are some critics and it's, it's perfectly normal. And in a way, what we see those who are really against this synod and this uh, call for synodality, that is a call of God for the church of the third millennium are against Pope Francis, but uh, at the core, in a way, they are criticizing uh, the Second Vatican Council. Um, so we are in this uh, process of the reform of the church, and I would like to quote how really this synod on synodality is really a way for Pope Francis after the, synod, the two synods on family, then the synod on young people, who have reawakened the, really the missionary synodality of the church. And that's why we see nowadays how young people are, are really driving force of uh, synodality. We see really that uh, this synod is a process to continue the reform of the church uh, opened, we can say, uh, especially uh, by the Second Vatican uh, Council. And um, this synod is at the service, we can say, of a long-term process of conversion and, uh, and a reform. And that's why I would like to conclude with this uh, quote from the working document uh, of the continental stage, um, paragraph 98 about the steps we are now uh, living. Looking to the future of the synodal process requires considering two very different time horizons. The first is the long-term horizon in which synodality takes the form of a perennial call to personal conversion and reform of the church. The second, clearly at the service of the first, is the one that focuses our attention on the events of the continental stage that we are experiencing. And in all the reports we have received from all dioceses and bishops' conferences, uh, reflecting the consultation and listening of the people of God, we can see, and I continue to quote uh, this working document for the continental stage, in the reports, the people of God express a desire to be less a church of maintenance and conservation, and more a church that goes out in mission. A connection emerges between deepening communion through synodality on the one hand and strengthening mission on the other. Being synodal leads into renewed mission. So really we can see from the beginning and through all the important steps uh, that Pope Francis as uh, marked through his pontificate that really is focus and the focus of uh, his reform is really mission, how to be a more missionary church to serve better 
the people of the earth in the context of, uh, of our world, to face the challenges and issues. And that's why uh, we are leaving this uh, call for synodality, because at this stage of the reception of the Second Vatican Council, especially through uh, the journey of the former synods of Bishop, the church has discerned that synodality is really the way uh, to be a missionary church today, um, the same church from the beginning, but in this context of today. So uh, it's about a process step by step that call both for a change of mindset, a change of culture, and Pofonsis is really highlighting first that to do this reform, we need uh, really a personal conversion and a cultural change to embrace this new style of synodality. But it also call uh, for a reform of the structures and uh, that's also a part of the discernment uh, we have now. But why Pope Francis has some critics, we can say it's perfectly normal because everywhere when you are in a process of reform and a process of change, you have fears, you have resistance, that's part of a spiritual process. And really, uh, that's my last word, what is really interesting, Pope Francis is showing us that uh, it's important not to be led by our fears, but led by what we have discerned as the call of the Holy Spirit uh, that will help us to leave the side of a clerical church to go uh, towards the side of a synodal church that is not written in advance. It's a creative path. And uh, the reform uh, led by Pope Francis is calling each of us to discern uh, personally and uh, with our community where we are, how to continue to answer the call of God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Natalie. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I'm just going to make a proposition. Because we are running a bit behind time, I invite people who have questions for these two speakers to send me messages on the chat, and then I will just read them to the speakers in the question and answer time. That said, our next speaker is Father Nobel Litton, Thank you. Um, as I was saying, so, uh, uh, Father Nobe Liton, I hope I haven't murdered your name, uh, Jesuit from Cameroon, he's an expert on Islam and Christian Muslim relations in Africa. He's currently working at Sirap Jesuit University visiting lecturer at ITCJ and Arupe Jesuit University. Uh, I'm welcome, Father Norbert, would you like to present on 10 years of Pope Francis Pontificate encounter with the Muslim world? Father Norbert? We are trying to reach Father Norbert. I've been here all along, but oh, thank I could you. unmute myself. So. Ah, there you go. Welcome, uh, Norbert. Would yeah, you thank you very much. Present. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to uh, Marcelo Inez and all the organizers for inviting me to be part of this conversation, uh, celebrating 10 years of uh, Pope Francis's uh, papacy. 
Um, I feel humbled really uh, sharing uh, the same panel with all those who have spoken before me and with Bishop Rodrigo also. Bato mentioned that he had his teachers on this panel. And since Bato taught me, it means I have not only my teacher, but also my grand teachers on the panel in a sense. Uh, so I'm grateful to be here. And uh, without much ado, I'm going to move ahead and share what I've prepared uh, for today. Now, can you hear me, please? The yes. screen goes at some point. OK, thank you. I'm going to share my screen with you. For some reason, Zoom is freezing, so I don't know. Um, are you not able to, sh to share it? I'm not even able to open it now. I thought somebody was controlling something from the other side. It might be from the ICT. Okay. okay. I, think, I think I'm back in control now. Oh, you're back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, can you see my screen? Yep, it's starting to screen share. Okay. There we go. Okay, that's good. Working. Yeah, yeah. So I was asked to speak about uh, Pope Francis's encounters uh, with uh, the Muslim world. And I'm basically going to do it in two parts. The first part will be uh, to briefly uh, say something about what interreligious dialogue is and its forms. I'm sure for most of you, this will be a reminder. Uh, for the rest, hopefully this gives you the background to what I'm going to say in the second part regarding Pope Francis's approach when it comes to his encounters with the Muslim world. Uh, dialogue, interreligious dialogue can be defined as all positive and constructive interreligious relations with individuals and communities of other faiths which are directed at mutual understanding and enrichment in obedience to truth and respect for freedom. It includes both witness and the exploration of respective religious convictions. I borrow this definition from Dialogue and Proclamation, a document published in 1991 jointly by the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue and the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. When it comes to the forms of dialogue, you, the church basically upholds uh, four official forms of dialogue. The first one is a dialogue of life, uh, where it basically has to do with uh, uh, being able to share the joys and sorrows of everyday life together as neighbors, as brothers and sisters. And one example I have here of the dialogue of life based on the images you have on my screen there, is my experience in Senegal, Senegalese Teranga. Uh, on the one hand, when it's time for the feast of Eid at, Eid at Ada, uh, Muslims share meat, yabhar, that is uh, meat from uh, the sheep, to, with, their, uh, with their Christian neighbors. Whereas on Good Friday, all Muslims in Senegal expect their Christian friends to offer them what is known as galah, it's a type of porridge prepared with millet and, uh, and peanut uh, paste. So that's the example of dialogue of life. We share life together, sharing life's joys and sorrows, relationships of uh, good neighbors living together in an area. Then the dialogue of action. This has to do with coming together to resolve issues of common interest. If you have issues, say, with electricity, water, or cleanliness, hygiene, the environment in a particular area, it doesn't only affect people of one faith, all are affected. So the dialogue of action is when we come together to try to resolve uh, these issues. An example still from our African context that I have in mind is the coming together of Cardinal Zapalenga of the Central African Republic of Bangui with Imam Abdullahi Wasalege uh, to help bring back peace after the confrontation between Seleka and Anti Balaka in the Central African Republic. I have this quote from Cardinal Zapalenga about their work together. He says, our mission is to disarm hearts and spirits with our words. That is our only weapon. Whereas uh, Imam Wasalege says, we have to desire for others what we desire for ourselves. So coming together to, to solve an issue that's of common interest, dialogue of action, and then the third 
is dialogue of theological exchange. And this has to do with specialists from either faith traditions discussing uh, theological dogmatic issues, if you want. And uh, an example I have in mind here has to do with a movement known as a common world between us and you. A movement that was born of a kind of a difficult situation, but gave positive fruits. Uh, it was born as a result of uh, Pope Benedict's speech in uh, Regensburg in September 2005, where quoting, quoting another author, mentioning an emperor that was wondering if Islam had brought anything but violence, and making clear that it wasn't his opinion, but the fact that it was a Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, quoting that uh, made a lot of waves. There was a response from a number of Muslim intellectuals, and then that began a dialogue movement between uh, scholars from both faith traditions, known as a common world between us and you. And finally, the dialogue of religious experience. This has to do with uh, uh, interactions based on sharing the way we live out our faith. It might be sharing about prayer, about the way we fast, etc. And the example I have in mind here is that of Christian de Cherche and his friend Mohamed. Christian de Cherche was uh, a monk among a number of monks killed in Algeria in 1996, the monks of Tiberin. Uh, you might have heard of them. There's a movie made about them. Uh, Christian de Cherche uh, tells us that he had a friend in the village where the monastery was located known as uh, Mohamed. And they will often meet to speak about spiritual things and pray together. On one occasion, when he had stayed for long without uh, interacting with Mohammed, uh, Mohammed called his attention to it, telling him, we have stayed for long without digging our well. And that's the expression they used to speak about uh, what they did together in terms of praying and uh, spiritual conversation. One day, Christian asked Mohammed, and that our well that we have been digging for so long, when we reach at the bottom, what kind of water are we going to find? And Mohammed told him, you have known me for this long and you're still asking me that question. At the bottom of our well, we'll neither find Christian water nor Catholic water, we will find the water of God. So dialogue of religious experience. So with this in the background, what's uh, Pope Francis's approach? First of all, I would like to mention some of his notable trips to Muslim majority countries. Uh, one in Turkey in 2014, um, where he made an important speech in front of the Dinayat, uh, that is uh, the organ in the Turkish government in charge of religious affairs, emphasizing the importance of, uh, of uh, inter-religious dialogue and his vision for it. Another trip in Azerbaijan, a trip in Egypt, where he notably visited Al-Azhar Mosque, uh, where uh, he met someone who has become a very close friend of his now, uh, Imam uh, Ahmad al tayeb the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar Mosque. We'll come back to that. And then in the United Arab Emirates, where in Abu Dhabi, they had um, an interfaith meeting, meeting sorry, on human fraternity, and a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together was issued at the end of that. In Morocco in 2019, where he praised Morocco's efforts to promote an Islam uh, that is tolerant, open to peace. And then in Iraq in 2021, where he notably had a meeting in Najaf with Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, uh, a, a very important, a very prominent figure in Shia Islam. And then finally in Bahrain in 2022 for the Bahrain Forum for Dialogue. So he has made a number of trips in 10 years in Muslim majority countries where Muslim Christian relations have been foregrounded. Now, with regard to his approach, uh, the first thing is that it's done in the spirit of Vatican II, and specifically in the spirit of Nostra Aetate, uh, an important declaration, an important watershed moment for the church when it comes to the church's official teaching with regard to uh, other faith traditions. And paragraph three of that uh, declaration speaks of uh, the esteem with which uh, the church considers Muslims. For the, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the entire paragraph, but it's something I highly recommend, paragraph three of Nostra Aetate. So for Francis's approach is within the spirit of that particular uh, document. And then one other element, and the different axes I'm giving here are not exhaustive. I'm sure you can 
uh, highlight other facets of Pope Francis's approach to the Muslim world, but these are a few that I could actually put forward for this talk. Uh, the second thing is emphasis on personal encounters, a spirituality of friendship. He has met uh, uh, Imam Ahmed al Tayeb of Al Azhar at least on seven occasions, if not more. And a deep friendship has been born of that uh, relationship. And that, uh, that's a hallmark of the way uh, Francis, uh, Pope Francis approaches interreligious relations, personal encounters, uh, not just at the institutional level, not just in terms of uh, writing documents, but he wants to meet people and develops a spirituality of friendship. And in relation to that, in his address to the president of the Dinayat at the Department for Religious Affairs in Turkey, during his trip to Turkey in uh, 2014, he said this about the relations between leaders. Good relations and dialogue between religious leaders have in fact acquired great importance. They represent a clear message addressed to their respective communities which demonstrates that mutual respect and friendship are possible, notwithstanding differences, notwithstanding differences. Such friendship, as well as being valuable in itself, becomes all the more meaningful and important in a time of crisis such as our own, crisis which in some parts of the world are disastrous for entire people. So a spirituality of friendship uh, that sustains his approach to the Muslim world. And he draws inspiration from that friendship, as mentioned in number five of uh, Fratelli Tutti, where he highlights the fact that uh, his friendship with uh, Imam al Tayeb has influenced the, the writing of uh, Fratelli Tutti, just like the friendship with uh, Patriarch Bartolomeo, the Orthodox Patriarch, influenced his writing of Laudato Si. The third axis is that is grounded in the conviction of a shared humanity. Uh, the image you have there of, is of his visit on the Greek island of Lesbos. And after that trip, he returned in his plane to Rome. He took uh, about 12 uh, refugees, all Muslims, Syrian refugees. Some told him, oh, you should have taken, some were criticizing, saying, oh, you should have taken Christian refugees that are also found there. But his approach is grounded in the conviction of a shared humanity beyond religious uh, differences. Uh, and you have these uh, references from the document on human fraternity and from uh, Fratelli Tutti that emphasize that the aspect of a shared humanity. For instance, in the document on human fraternity, it says, faith leads a believer to see in the other a brother or sister to be supported and loved. Through faith in God, who has created the universe, creatures and all human beings equal on account of his mercy, Believers are called to express this human fraternity by safeguarding creation and the entire universe, etc. So grounded in the conviction of a shared humanity. And then also one thing that I noticed about his approach to the Muslim world is a profound, you could say delicate, respect for differences. As you might know, uh, the two biggest uh, currents within Islam are Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Uh, for long, the engagement of the church has mainly been with Sunni Islam, but Pope Francis approached uh, the Shia community as well. So on one side there, you have him with Ahmed al Tayeb, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. As you might know, Al-Azhar is uh, kind of uh, the leading, uh, the leading, uh, the leading most, many uh, Sunni Muslims look up to Al-Azhar uh, when it comes to theological thought. And then on the other side, you have a meeting with Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani, who is a prominent spiritual leader of Shia Muslims worldwide, met him in Iraq. So a delicate respect for differences. So he doesn't choose sides. He knows that you have these two big families within Islam, and he makes sure that he uh, meets, uh, engages with both sides without giving the impression that he's choosing sides. And then, one thing that is not noticeable in his approach also is that he prioritizes dialogue of life and action between the four forms you have there. I'm not saying that he totally neglects uh, dialogue of religious experience and dialogue of theological exchange, but it is clear that there is a priority given to dialogue of life and dialogue of action, because that's the approach to dialogue in his opinion that allows him to engage with uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters 
in a way that enables them to work together to solve issues of pressing concern for humanity, such as climate change, the refugee crisis, wars, etc. Now, uh, finally, you know that you might know that uh, one of the tensions, the ongoing tension since Vatican II, with uh, the kind of turn that the church has taken with uh, emphasis on the need for dialogue, there has been a debate okay, is it dialogue that's a priority, or do we continue with the missionary mandate proclamation evangelization? And a question was put to Pope Francis. I think well, it was on the plane on during his trip back from uh, from Bahrain or Abu Dhabi. I don't remember correctly, uh, but a journalist put a question to him that uh, now people are wondering what should be our priority. Should it be dialogue or should it be mission proclamation evangelization? Uh, in his reply, Pope Francis referenced his encounter for breakfast with. Uh, youth, young people from all over the world during the World Youth Day in Krakow in Poland. And he said a young man asked him uh, this question that, okay, I have this atheist friend at the university. I've tried by all possible means to convert him to Christianity, but nothing has worked so far. As Pope, is there anything you can tell me that will help me bring him to the Christian faith? And he said, say nothing, say nothing to that atheist friend that your duty is to leave your faith in all its integrity. And if that friend one day asks you, how do you explain some of your choices? How do you explain your way of life? Then you can speak to him. But that your first and primary way of evangelizing should be your life of faith. And in Evangelii Gaudium, he says in this dialogue, ever friendly and sincere, Attention must always be paid to the essential bond between dialogue and proclamation. What is not helpful is a diplomatic openness which says yes to everything in order to avoid problems. But this will be a way of dece deceiving ourselves, deceiving others and denying them the good which we have been given to share generously with others. Evangelization and interreligious dialogue, far from being opposed, mutually support and nourish, nourish one another. And finally, to end, hopefully my sound will be loud enough, a, a video of a minute and a few seconds about his prayer intention. Uh, I think it was in March, 2016, in regard to that religious dialogue. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, la mayor parte buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera en esta multitud en este abanico de religiones hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos todos somos hijos de Dios Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. So those are some of the different uh, approaches I could identify in uh, Pope Francis's uh, encounter with uh, the Muslim world. As I said at the beginning, it's not exhaustive. There are many other ways you could eventually identify it based on what he has done and what he has written. But thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Norbert.
Uh, I have received two questions through the chat. Uh, I think they're both directed to you, Sister Natalie. Um, fairly short questions. Could you shed light on the plight of workers in the perspective of Francis, and how do you think that fits into our, our synodal process? And the second question, is there some kind of monitoring that has been done by the church of how the synodal process has been done um, around the world, in, particularly in the global south? Okay, thank you for the question. I will begin by the, um, the second one. You know, really, synodality is an art. It's, it's not a technique like, or um, oh. something like mathematics, you have a formula and you just apply it. You always leave synodality and the synodal methodology uh, through the culture, the, the context. And it's true that um, we have proposed for this synod the methodology of spiritual conversation. Uh, that is uh, really a way uh, to listen to each other, rooted into prayer, into the listening of the word of God, and a, a way to discern together. But we see that uh, for many people, it's something very new. And to do that, uh, you need good facilitators who are trained in discernment, personal discernment and communal discernment. So we have tried, you know, and this synod is, it, it's not just, in, just something coming from Rome. We are just a rather small team here at the General Secretariat of the Synod. And then it has to be done at the grassroots with, um, many, many different people. Uh, so there are different ways to, to do that. What we have asked that has really helped the process, we have asked that in each diocese, each bishop's conference, but also religious community or religious order or lay movement, there is a synod coordinator and preferably a team. But we see that there is a great um, need, we can say, for formation. Uh, those who are already trained in spiritual conversation and uh, to lead process of discernment in command are really called to serve uh, in, in some countries. It's, uh, we have seen, for instance, that many Jesuits have been involved or people from CLC. Uh, we can highlight, and I'm very grateful for uh, what has been done in Africa with the African Synodality Initiative. Uh, so we encourage a lot, but then it's also up uh, to the local churches. Uh, but it's true that those who have already an experience are really called, you know, to promote synodality and uh, to help the, gr the greatest challenge and issue about synodality is that it's, it's a learning by doing through an experience. I'm always happy to do webinars or talk, but you can't learn synodality just through a, a book or an academic lecture. It's, it's really a learning by doing through um, a, an experience. That's why we can, uh, we encourage uh, that uh, the greatest number of people have really this experience and for that we really need facilitators who are trained and can help others to enter into uh, the, the experience. That's what uh, I can say. Maybe could you repeat the first question please because I didn't catch up everything. Okay, the question was simply about how does the question of workers and workers' rights fit into the synodal process? I think that's, that would be a, a summary. It's a question of economic justice for workers and things like that. It comes from someone from a justice and peace commission in a parish. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Um, you know, what is very important is to have in mind when we speak about synodality and it's written in our preparatory document and then it, it came up along, uh, along the way. 
we should always speak about a missionary synodality. When you look at this synodality, you need to have in mind two perspectives. The first one we can say is ad intra, how we are all together protagonists in the church, giving our voice, journeying together. So it's a way to be church among uh, the Batais, but it should never be separated from a way to be the church, we can say, add extra with this style of uh, dialogue with the society, ecumenism, interreligious dialogue. Uh, so uh, as really Pope Francis also is uh, highlighting uh, that uh, we need to be an outgoing uh, church. So it goes end in end. That's why uh, all this topic of justice and peace, issue, ecology, are really part of uh, also the vision of uh, synodality. And it came up through the synodal consultation and uh, the, especially the working document for the continental stage. Uh, and also what I have experienced in the different uh, synodal continental assemblies, I like very strongly the call to be together to face all those big issues for our world of today, justice and peace, ecology, migration. So it's really part, uh, you know, of the of the synodal process because the fruit of the synod, and if we are called to be a synodal church, is really to serve better, we can say, the common good of the society and the common good of our common uh, home. Thank you so much, for, uh, Sister Natalie. Uh, I have a question, and it will have to be our final question for Father Norbert. One of our observers on the chat said, there's a tendency in many countries in Africa where there's a strong Islamic presence for Islam to try and gain political dominance. Uh, and once they have gained a certain level of political dominance, there's a tendency to oppress Christians in that country. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, I think the broad question is, um, how do you deal with the fact that there, seem to be, there seems to be a trend in Islam towards a kind of Islamization of societies? Would you like to comment on that in the light of Pope Francis? Christianity and Islam are both uh, missionary uh, traditions, and as such, uh, given the opportunity, they will want uh, the society in which they find themselves to reflect uh, the values they believe in. But one thing I sense also behind, uh, behind that question uh, is an issue I think uh, that could be uh, specific to Africa and perhaps certain parts of, uh, parts of Asia where you have this kind of uh, societies that are pluralistic in terms of the religious makeup of the societies. There is a sense in which uh, if you have a situation in which uh, a particular ethnic group or a particular group within society, the identity of that group is, uh, is uh, associated with a particular religious tradition. Let me take an example. I'm not saying that is a case in, uh, in Nigeria, but that's the example that comes to mind for me right now. If uh, in my mind, for instance, once you mention somebody is an Aousa from the north of Nigeria, and immediately I think of, oh, he's Muslim. You tell me somebody is an Igbo from the southeast of Nigeria, immediately I think Sorry, we've lost you. Um, um, no, but we've lost you. I think we've lost Norbert. Um, trying to bring him back. Uh, folks, where is, uh, am I audible? Think, oh yes, you're back. Thanks. I'm just oh. trying to see if, if we'd lost you or <laughs> somewhere we got lost. Carry on. Sorry. You, you, you it might were, be my internet saying. connection. I didn't yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh, so I was just saying that uh, one risk for us uh, on the continent uh, has to do with the fact that you have different ethnic groups and at times you have an ethnic group whose identity is closely 
tied down to a particular religious tradition. And I was giving the example, I'm not saying it's a case, but the example coming to mind was that, okay, in Nigeria, for instance, if in my mind, a Hausa from the north of Nigeria rhymes with uh, Islam, and an Igbo from the southeast of Nigeria rhymes with Christianity, then if there is political competition or competition for economic resources between those two blocks, within, between those two ethnic groups, whether you like it or not, it immediately takes on a religious connotation. Immediately takes on a religious connotation. And as such, when analyzing such situations, it's important not to simplify, oversimplify them and simply view them as uh, competition between different religious traditions that are trying to uh, uh, take over the country. At times, people can use religion as a way of, uh, as a political means, not so, as a political sure. means. Generally, there is something much more deeper. There's a co political competition, there is economic competition, etc. So do not limit yourself to that kind of lens. And connecting that to Pope Francis, his approach would be that, okay, let's see each other. Let's try and see each other first and foremost as brothers and sisters, sharing a common humanity before we view our religious differences as uh, uh, something that actually keeps us apart. Thank you very much, Norbert. Um, I'm sure there'll be many more questions, but we, we are literally running out of time. So I want to introduce our last speaker. Our last speaker is a former Jesuit provincial, a former bishop, and from Latin America. No, it's not Pope Francis making a guest appearance. It's Bishop Rodrigo Mejia Saldariaga, a uh, former provincial of Eastern Africa province, uh, former vicar emeritus, vic, apostolic vicar emeritus of Soto, Ethiopia, teaching the Bishop of Vulturia, who is going to give a kind of wrap up of our conversation. He also has been, was principal of and co-founder of Hakima University College and is currently, I think, finishing another book. Bishop Rodrigo, welcome to our conversation. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Very good. I am very glad to contribute. I am very old. I think I am the oldest of this meeting and uh, a retired bishop. So something like in the periphery of the church as well. So, but I am blessed to participate in these synodal activities because uh, the technology today, Zoom in concrete, facilitate these contacts. Uh, I have taken all the notes as much as I could. All the interventions have been extremely interesting, very relevant and to the point. Uh, I don't want to add new things. This is not my point, but perhaps underline some aspects. Uh, I have the first sentence of Father Marcel Winesa when he said, liturgy is not enough. I want to develop that because uh, we have a tendency in the church to folklorize our celebrations and to make them a social funny celebration and there is no legacy to that. There is no legacy to folkloric celebrations. We print uh, t-shirts, we print caps, and we make uh, stickers for the cars, and that, that's it. We have had years, very important, the year of mercy, the jubilee year, but uh, of these celebrations and that way, there is no legacy. What there is legacy is really to what Sister Natalie insisted on, conversion. It's a change of the church, and we are the church. Therefore, it's we who have to change. It's not the change of the Pope. It's the change of the people of God, and that is the great challenge. It's a conversion of heart and minds. And that is why I think here our hope only is for the future, the prophecy of Gamaliel that was the, at the very beginning of the church, 
she resolved the question of legacy and fruit remaining the fruit. If it is from only human beings, that will not last. But if it is from God, nobody can stop it. And you will find even that you are fighting against the Holy Spirit. That was said concerning the first Christians at the beginning of the evangelization. And that has to be our conviction even today. Synodality is not a fashion. And uh, it was very well underlined as well. That is nothing even new in the church. The International Theological Commission in the fantastic document they produced and that I recommend to read about the theology of synodality, they show how that was the practice at the beginning of the church. And for other reasons, the Western church took more the model of the Roman Empire in a vertical way, pyramidal way of authority, and the synodality was lost. We are trying to recover what we should be. And that is very important for those who like tradition. We are at the chase of a tradition, not to go to the ashes of the ancestors, but to the fire they had. And that is the important thing. One thing that I saw indirectly mentioned everywhere in all the talks, but not explicitly, is the question of cultures, synodality and cultures. Uh, Pope Francis is very strong in the joy of the gospel that it is imperative to evangelize the cultures in order to inculturate the gospel. If we uh, try to proclaim the gospel, ignoring the differences of cultures and the need for the conversion of cultures as well, our evangelization may be simply cosmetic, celebrating external feasts, but not working and functional in times of conflicts, especially of, between ethnic groups and tribes. That is one of our main challenges here in Africa. So I hope that through synodality, really we may work more deeply at the level of a particular church and the particular church to become aware that uh, it is like the knot of a fishing net. Every knot counts in a fishing net. If a knot fails, the hole will be bigger than one knot and then the net will be useless. So that is the great conscience I think we have to, to, to gain today. We blessed God. I have had the opportunity to meet uh, Pope Francis several times, not only in Rome, but here also in Kangem in our parish. Uh, I, I was the one welcoming him in our parish. And we have had different dialogues with the group of bishops in a very friendly way. I admire his simplicity. He's a real a man of simplicity, a man of listening. We need today, we need him more than ever. And at the 10th day or the 10th year of his election, I think we have to pray for him, for his health, first of all. Thanks to God, the problem of the knee is going better. Although he confessed with all simplicity that it had been a humiliating moment to be in a wheelchair. But he needs his knee, of course, but we need his head and his heart. And they are in a very good shape, thanks to God. So I thank you very much, the Dr. Marcel Wineza, the organizer of this uh, en encounter. And uh, I think that the organizers are planning to produce from this encounter a print, a kind of a small book that will reach others who could not attend to this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bishop Rodrigo. And uh, just
to wrap up, I think we must thank everybody who's participated. I've been closely monitoring our screen and we started off with about 50, very quickly got to 150. And even though we're running a bit late, we're still at 142. And I think that's a measure of uh, the way in which this has become an important conversation. And I think Bishop Rodrigo's suggestion is a very good one. And perhaps we, we'll, we'll talk about it in future. I'd like to hand over this uh, conference to the principal once more to give his final words and to lead us in a kind of final prayer. Father Gourneza, let me see if I've accidentally muted him. Yes, I have been unmuted. Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to offer a few remarks at the end, really with uh, depth of gratitude uh, to God who, who gave the inspiration uh, of, to, of this idea. Uh, that came initially as a dream and then shared with, uh, with the faculty, the academic board, and everyone bought in the idea. It was really a fruit of prayer. And so I would like to begin really thanking God. And as one French uh, proverb from an unknown author says, la gratitude est la mémoire du cœur. Uh, gratitude is the memory of the heart. So in thanking God, there are also many people to thank. In the name of Hekima University College, uh, I would like to uh, really express our sincere gratitude. Let me begin with uh, the audience. Uh, so many, uh, Father Egan has mentioned that there are 100 and, uh, 140 plus, but actually there are, there are many people following uh, through YouTube of Hekima University College. There were many people following through Radio Maria uh, of Kenya. There were many people following through uh, the Rwanda and Catholic TV, Patches TV, and uh, many other medias. Uh, many people have been sharing. So we have had uh, an audience. But I think the most important thing is not the numbers, is the quality of conversation uh, that has been expressed here. So in thanking all these social medias, thanking all of you, so thanking Radio Maria, thanking Pachis TV, the Archdiocese of Nairobi that invited us to celebrate today, and uh, this, uh, our ICT, then we also proceed by thanking our, our speakers. Uh, we reached out, out to you and you are generous with your time. And I think it is very evident with your insightful presentations uh, not just insightful, touching as well. So you spoke not only from the head, but also from the heart. Since part of our school is a theology school and peace studies, uh, there's one uh, author who says that if the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of theology could easily pass from the minds of the professors to the minds of the students. But it is possible, it will not be lived until it has passed through the hearts of both the professors and the students. So our hope is that what we have heard from our speakers has moved from the head to the heart. So to you, uh, Father Orobator, to you, Chris Roney, Mr. Chris Roney, to you, Sister Natalie Beckett, and uh, Father Norbert Rituang, and our Bishop, Bishop Rodrigo Meia, in the name of Hekima University College, I express our sincere gratitude. Your presentations were wide ranging and also acknowledging the limitations of time. I am sure in your papers, you will even be more, uh, more expansive. So I thank you very much. I'm grateful to the Hekima Academic Board, to the council, to the trustees, and so many people who supported the idea, to the deans of our schools, and in a special way, to our students and the energetic dean of student. At the heart of a university is research, publication, and also making an impact locally and globally. And I think what we have done here meets both. So there is a research, 
and there will be a publication of this. And I hope you have also, with the help of God, made an impact locally here where we are and globally. And it is evident from the speakers, speakers from Europe, from America, from West Africa. Then uh, we have we have uh, an African Colombian, and then we have uh, Father Roberto. So it's quite a, a wide ranging uh, uh, panel. So thank you very much. Ekima is known, but I think you have made it better known. Thank you very much. So Hekima University College is now better known. You have taken it to greater heights. As we look to the future, after your presentations, let me say this. In his homily for the first Pentecost Mass that is celebrated as Pope, Father uh, Pope Francis say, asked his audience, do we have the, the courage, and I quote, do we have the courage to strike out a long new path which God's newness sets before us? Or do we resist barricaded in the transient or passing structures we have, which have lost their capacity for openness to what is new? A church of the Holy Spirit must be ready to be open to new roads. End of quote. And I think that has become very evident listening to Roberto, listening to the dirty shoes, uh, that the image that Chris Roney gave, the synodality and the, the, uh, the presentation on, on the real spirituality of encounter and friendship, and then from the bishop. One thing is clear, the next conclave will likely happen when cardinals know what has come out of the synod of synodality. And so this will be a game changer. They will get into the conclave, knowing the needs and the challenges of the church. The consistory of cardinals has never been as Catholic or better as universal as it is now. And so that's another legacy of Pope Francis, if you allow me to use the word. Francis has initiated a process. This has come out very well. And he knows, and to quote him, that time is greater than space. While the future is in God's hands, Francis is definitely is a man of God and a man of hope. And recently he said this, and I think this really helps us to go against that desire with his legacy last. He said this, he who hopes will never be disappointed because hope has the face of the risen Christ. So we don't have to be worried of what becomes after Pope Francis. And yes, Francis has refused to be put into compartments, to be a town boy. He remains an enigma, but he knows very well that the Holy Spirit is in charge. We thank you very much for being with us in this uh, important conversation. I thank all of you and uh, Please uh, make our Hekima College known and invite you all to subscribe to our social medias and join us for, stud for studies here at Hekima and we look forward to welcoming you here. Thank you very much to our, pre our presenters. We could not have chosen better. Thank you. Since we have uh, uh, probably more than one bishop among us, but the one whom we have seen more clearly we have uh, Bishop Rodrigo. If uh, he allows me, may I ask you, as we conclude, to give us a final blessing. Let me ask our ICT to unmute un un Bishop Rodrigo, please. Now, is okay now? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. I invite all of you together. I will pray to our Father slowly, and each one of you will pray together, wherever you are, together with me, because I think this is the prayer that the Lord gave us for the church forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and thank Thanks you very everybody. much, Father, Father Egan. Right. Wonderful thank job. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Very reward. Good evening. Good afternoon. Very reward. Very rich. Thanks a lot. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. God bless. Father uh, Nomaro, Mobangiz, are you still there? Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Greetings from Okavari, Father Domaro Mobangizi. <laughs> oh, thank you very much.